Physics in Action. I am your host, Miss Nielsen, and today I am reporting breaking news. We have discovered the connection between waves and musical instruments. That's right, folks. Today I am reporting on the phenomenon known as sound. Before the break, you tested your problem-solving skills with the wave equation, and today you are going to continue to do that. However, before we tackle that, we have some important knowledge and information to share with you regarding waves and sound. First, we're gonna head over to the field. Mr. Willauer has a report for us regarding how sound is created and the speed of sound in different materials. Then we'll head over to my classroom and I'll tell you a little bit about different musical instruments. We've got some good demos for you today. As always, you're gonna to wanna to take notes on today's report. Heading over to you, Mr. Willauer. Hello everyone, Mr. Willauer here. We're gonna be talking about sound today. Um, what I have here is a little animation to hopefully help you visualize what's going on with sound. Those little white dots there are representing air molecules on both sides of this guitar string. So when I click play over here, the guitar string is going to be plucked. And if this weren't slowed down, that guitar string would go back and forth, oh, 600 times in one second or 400 times, depending on what note it is. So it'd be going back and forth really quickly. I like this because it slows it down and we can see what's happening to the individual particles. And now as it's oscillating back and forth, you can see the disturbance is moving to the left on this side, to the right on this side. I wanna get it here so I can pause it real quick. And if I pause it here, we'll notice here the particles are all smushed up together and over here they're kind of spread out. That's because this is a longitudinal wave. The particles are oscillating to the left and to the right and the wave is being disturbed or the, the, the disturbance, the wave, is moving to the right on one side and to the left on the other. This is a longitudinal wave. That's what sound is. Sound is a longitudinal wave. So now we have a solid, liquid, and a gas. Well, these are speakers here in this animation. I found it, it was good, I wanted to share. And here would be the gas particles. Notice that they're spread apart as compared with the solid particles, which are spaced very close together. Which of these two, gas or solid, would you expect sound to travel the fastest through? Have a guess? Well, let's go ahead and turn on the animation and see if we can see which one it is. So you can start to watch the pulses travel through. And it's easy to tell here because the sound wave hasn't even gone all the way through yet and in the gas, and yet in the solid, it's traveled very quickly. So can we think through why that's the case? Why does sound travel more quickly in a solid than in a gas? Well, in a solid, the particles, the atoms are very close together. Molecules are close together. So when that sound pushes on the first row very quickly because there's not a lot of space between them, that disturbance can be passed to the next row, the next row, the next row, all the way across. And again, those particles will oscillate to the left and to the right because the disturbance is going to the right. So it's a longitudinal wave because the particles are oscillating, vibrating back and forth in parallel to the disturbance um, the direction of the disturbance. Down here in the gas, we've got a lot of space between them. So it takes some time for that first one to hit down here um, and transfer that uh, disturbance to the next row, the next row, the next row. And so we can see that the sound takes a lot longer to travel through a gas than it does through the liquid. Okay, so one final thing to talk about in terms of sound is lightning and the thunder that you hear. So let's say you see this bolt of lightning hit the ground here, and let's say you are standing, oh, on this side of the field here. So you're just standing here minding your own business, everything's good, um, and then a couple of seconds later you hear the sound. Well, how can you determine how far away that lightning strike is from you? Well, you can use the rule of um, counting in seconds and then dividing by five to figure out the distance because it takes sound about uh, five seconds to travel one mile. So let's say you hear the lightning strike and you count, and let's say you count 2.5 seconds. Okay, so 2.5 seconds, okay? And then we can multiply that by, and we'll see if I can fit it all in here, um, one mile. I'll do one MI um, over five seconds. And then when you calculate that out, 
That works out to be 0.5 miles away. So if you hear a lightning or you hear thunder and you start counting after that, one Mississippi, two Mississippi, three Mississippi, um, and you get to two and a half seconds, you know that that lightning strike was about a half mile from where you are. Thanks, Mr. Willauer, for that overview on sound waves. Next up, we're going to talk about the connection between sound and musical instruments. But before we do, I just want to do a quick review of those ideas about sound waves. So sound waves are longitudinal waves, which means that they propagate parallel to the medium. And this is kind of what it looks like um, with a speaker um, projecting those waves into air. Um, so with a bigger picture here, you notice that the air particles aren't really moving that much, but the wave is still traveling to the right with those compressions and those rarefactions. Um, so just like with uh, transverse waves, we can actually map a longitudinal wave as a transverse wave in which the distance between the crests or the distance between the compressions are the wavelength. That's still the same thing. Um, also, we can take a look at the fact that we still have an equilibrium point, which means we still have that rest area with our longitudinal waves. And still, with longitudinal waves, the distance from the rest to the crest or the equilibrium point to the crest is the amplitude. Um, so once again, taking a look at this longitudinal wave on the left, we've got some compressions that we can clearly see where the air particles are compressed together. And the distance between those compressions gives us that wavelength. So again, sound is a longitudinal wave. So now we can talk a little bit about the connection between sound and music. Um, so one connection that we see is with frequency. So frequency with music relates to the pitch of the sound. So the higher the frequency, the higher the pitch, the lower the frequency, the lower the pitch. So a lot of instruments use middle C as its tuning point. Um, so middle C is about 262 Hertz, which means we can have higher or lower frequencies. Also, the amplitude of the wave relates to the loudness of the sound or the volume. So the higher the volume of um, sound, the higher the amplitude of that longitudinal wave. So these are the two big connections we see between sound and music is that the frequency relates to the pitch and that the amplitude relates to the volume. Um, now we can talk about musical instruments. So there's three different types of musical instruments that we can uh, categorized as strings, open tube, and closed tube. And before we talk about those instruments, we have to define what standing waves are. So standing waves, a uh, standing wave is a stationary wave that oscillates in time but doesn't move in space. And we're going to talk about that in relation to strings. So strings are very special because it's really easy for us to visualize what happens with a string when it's plucked. So when we pluck a string, that string oscillates back and forth and back and forth and back and forth, but it's not really moving anywhere in space, right? It's not traveling forwards or backwards. It's just bouncing back and forth on the string. And you notice we still have that wave shape there with our string in that the length of the string is actually half of a wavelength. So that means the shorter and the skinnier the string is, the higher the frequency, right? Because if we make that length shorter, that means our wavelength is going to be shorter, which increases the frequency. We've got a higher pitch for shorter and skinnier strings. But the longer and the wider that string gets, that means that we have a lower frequency. Because if we increase the length of the string, that's going to increase the wavelength, which decreases the frequency. So we've got a lower frequency. So if we were to make that string longer, then we would see that we would have a lower frequency. This is kind of particular, so you don't really need to know this whole half wavelength thing, but we're just kind of giving some background today. So some examples of strings are guitar or bass, violin, cello, viola, and I'm going to give you an example right now. I brought my ukulele in today so you guys can see an example of a string instrument. A ukulele is pretty much just a teeny guitar. It's only got four strings as opposed to the guitar, which has six. But you'll notice that these strings are pretty much all the same length. So these middle two are a little bit longer, um, but they're pretty much the same length, not much difference there in those lengths. So the only thing that determines their pitch or their frequency is their thickness. So you might see, it's hard to see here, but this is the thickest string on the ukulele, is this second one. 
but I'm given four different frequencies, four different strings on the ukulele. I've got a G, C, that's that low one, E, and A. So the A is my highest frequency, highest pitch, it is the skinniest string there. So if I wanted to change the frequency to play different notes, I have to change the length of the string. So you'll notice that the uh, strings are not connected to the fretboard, um, and that's how I'm able to change their length. So if I want to play an A, but I want to raise that pitch, raise that frequency, I need to make the string shorter, so I press my finger into the string, into the fretboard, and I actually change that length of the string. So I turn an A into a C. So higher frequency, because I'm making the string shorter, that shortens the wavelength, which increases the frequency. Remember, lower the wavelength, higher the frequency. So I can play any note that's higher than the ones I'm already given on the ukulele. So I'm going to play a little tune for you now, and hopefully you recognize this song. Sweet Child of Mine by Guns N' Roses. But that's the ukulele, that's a string instrument. Next up we're talking about open tube and closed tube instruments. Um, and they're not too much different, so we're going to talk about them together. Open tubes are tubes that are open on both ends, so think about a boom whacker. So um, right in the middle of that tube would be the equilibrium point, and this is kind of the wave shape that's um, formed by the air inside, where we've got a crest on one open end and a trough on the other open end. So crest to trough, that's another half wavelength. So we see that similarity between open tubes and strings. So half a wavelength is the length of the tube, which um, closed tubes are a little bit different. So closed tubes are not closed on both ends, but just rather one end. And the way that the air um, is formed into a wave inside the tube looks something like this where we've got um, a node actually on the closed end and we have a crest on the open end in relationship to that equilibrium point so again this is very particular you don't really need to know this it just kind of contextualizes it a little bit better for us so the length of a closed tube is equal to a quarter of the wavelength so again we see with both of these tubes the shorter and the skinnier the tube is the higher the frequency. Again, because if we shorten the tube, we shorten the wavelength, which increases the frequency. And again, similar to strings, the longer and the wider the tube gets, the lower the frequency we have, because we increase that length of the tube, which increases the wavelength, lowers that frequency. So we're going to have lower pitched instruments that are longer and wider tubes. So some examples of open tubes are flutes or piccolos and boom whackers. Um, those are really the only two open tubes we see. But some examples of closed tubes are pretty much every other woodwind instrument. So clarinet, oboe, saxophone, trumpet, trombone, euphonium, tuba, all of those other instruments are closed tube. And actually, Miss Collins is going to give us an overview of open tube um, instruments and closed tube instruments right now. I am Mrs. Collins, one of the band teachers here at Monona Grove High School. Um, I'm going to play some instruments for you today and hopefully explain how they work for you. Um, so the first instrument I have is a flute. Um, all the woodwind instruments make sound by you blowing through something. Uh, flute is interesting because you're not blowing into anything, you're actually blowing your air over this and your air splits it and that's how your sound is created. Um, with all the band instruments, as you add fingers, your pitch goes lower. Uh, the flute is a cylindrical instrument, and I want to make sure that's correct. Pretty sure that's right. Um, what that means is when I go from a low note to a higher note, it overblows by an octave. So like the low note I played was D, and then when I add more air, I also play D. So that's something really nice about flute. Um, saxophone's the same way, oboe's the same way, bassoon's the same way. And I'm gonna play a little something for you. Uh, this is the 
clarinet. This is my main instrument, so hopefully I sound the best on this one. Um, but the clarinet is interesting because, once again, as you add fingers, it goes lower. But because of the shape of the clarinet, when you, we have this thing in the back called the register key. When you add that, it does not go up an octave. So like a G does not become a high G. It goes up a 13th. So a low G would become a high D. So for clarinets, they have to learn quite a few different notes. Um, I'm gonna play something for you. Hopefully some of you recognize this, enjoy. work and now this is going to seem really goofy what you do is you lick your lips you put them together and you go and then that sound is amplified through the instrument so to get a sound on the mouthpiece if I just blow air I get no sound if I buzz it is amplified same thing with the trumpet so I'm going to do that all together and you get your trumpet sound. So all brass instruments work this way, that you have to buzz, and then the buzz sound is amplified through the instrument. Um, using what you know about sound and size of instruments, the smaller the instrument, the higher the pitch, the larger the instrument, the lower the pitch. So if you look around, you can see a tube up there, and then we have a bunch of Sousa phones over here, and those are like the lowest notes because they are the largest instruments. Um, one other really cool thing about how brass instruments work, and I don't know if you're going to learn the harmonic series, but basically the idea is any tube you have, even if it's like a garden hose, if you buzz into it, you have a set um, series of notes that you're going to get. And basically what's happening is I believe it's something along like as your air speeds up, it just hits those certain notes. Uh, so without pushing anything, I can get a lot of different notes. And then it goes higher. Um, because I'm not a trumpet player, I can't get all the super high ones. Uh, but if you have any friends that play brass instruments, they'll tell you that they can get all those really high notes just by speeding up your air and kind of tightening your lips. Thanks for joining us today here at Physics in Action. We hope you enjoyed learning a little bit about how sound is created and how different musical instruments are able to produce that sound. As always, I hope you took notes on today's report and you are going to complete now Worksheet 2, which has got some questions about musical instruments and more questions on the wave equation. I'm Miss Nielsen, Physics in Action.